Hello, church. It's Palm Sunday. It's another day to celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to start out by singing. So I want to thank this morning, Dominic, for joining Susie and I in, in leading the songs. And thanks to Becky for running the computer in the back so that you can follow along with the songs. When the Old Testament saint, uh, Job, went through his own suffering and his hardship, this was his response. It's recorded in Job 121. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Nevertheless, blessed be the name of the Lord. Matt Redmond wrote a song based on that verse. So why don't you join us in your homes and singing with us?
Amen. It is no doubt the most well-known passage of Scripture in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Matt Crocker and Marty Sampson took those words and wrote a beautiful song called God So Loved. So why don't you join us in singing that now?
Kent Hughes wrote a commentary on the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> and in that commentary, he shared the following news release from 1977. And it said this. On December 4, 1977, in Bangui, the capital of the Central African Empire, the world witnessed the coronation of His Imperial Majesty, Osaka I. The price tag for the event was $25 million. The blare of trumpets and the roll of drums announced the approach of the new king. The procession began with eight of Osaka's 29 official children parading down the royal carpet to their seats. They were followed by Jean Bedel Bokassa II, the heir to the throne, who was dressed in a white admiral's uniform with a gold braid. Catherine, the favorite of Osaka's nine wives, followed. And she was wearing a $73,000 gown that was covered with pearls. The emperor arrived in an imperial coach, decked out with gold eagles and drawn by six matched Anglo-Norman horses. With the nation's marine band blaring a song entitled, The Sacred March of His Majesty, the king entered wearing a 32-pound robe decorated with 785,000 scattered pearls and gold embroidery. White gloves covered his hands, pearl slippers on his feet. On his brow, he wore a gold crown of laurel wreaths like those worn by Roman consuls of old, a symbol of favor with the gods. As the sacred march came to a conclusion, Bokassa seated himself on this two and a half million dollar throne. He took his gold laurel wreath off of his head, and as Napoleon had done 173 years earlier, he took a two and a half million dollar crown which was topped with an 80-carat diamond, and he placed it on his own head. And at 10.43 a.m. on December 7, 1977, the 20th century saw a new emperor. And I think you'd agree with me that that was a, a pretty elaborate celebration. It kind of makes uh, the birthday card I got for Susie this year look kind of pale by comparison. But what we're going to be doing on this Palm Sunday is we're going to examine a different kind of of coronation. So if you've got your Bibles, why don't you open up to Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, and we're going to be reading verses 29 to 31 to start out. Luke 19, starting verse 29. As Jesus approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say to them, the Lord needs it. So on Jesus' entry to Jerusalem, several things stand out to me that I believe have something to speak into our, our own hearts today. So firstly, as king, Jesus has the right to tell us to do things that may not make sense to us. You know, I think that far too often uh, when we read the Bible today, we read it like it was a play or a drama, as if all of the characters had the script ahead of time, knowing what their role was that they were to play and how things were going to turn out in the end. But the disciples, they didn't know that Jesus would enter Jerusalem in triumph, only to be betrayed and arrested and crucified. Now, he tried to explain this to them, but they just didn't understand and I'm sure at this moment they didn't understand on, on this particular day why he told them to go into town and basically steal a donkey. So let me try and contemporize this a little bit. Suppose Jesus told you to go to your local grocery store where you would find a brand new Lexus in the parking lot with the keys in it and nobody standing around you. And God told you to bring that back to him. And if anyone asks, just tell him the Lord needs it. How many of you would be comfortable following those instructions? You know, God has a way of asking us to, to do things sometimes that don't make sense. Elsewhere in the gospel narrative, we find Jesus giving directions to his followers that didn't make sense. For example, we find this in, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 5, as a part of his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this, <clears throat> You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. 
If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. And then down to verse 43, it says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So again, sometimes Jesus asks us to do things that may not make a lot of sense, but as king, he has every right to do so. Secondly, as king, Jesus has the right to demand that, that we give something to him that may be very dear to us, very valuable to us. The result of his command back in Luke 19 was that the disciples found things just as Jesus said they would be. We'll pick up reading at verse 32. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as Jesus had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying it? And they replied, The Lord needs it. Now, I can remember back in the, the mid-1990s when I was between pastorates, uh, I started working for a friend of mine that had his own lawn and tree business. And when I would weed eat too close to somebody's flower bed, or, or when I would mow too far away from the house, or when I parked the truck in the wrong spot, he had a habit of saying, what are you doing? Well, I'm sure the owners of that donkey must have looked at those disciples and, and shouted something like, what are you doing? But what amazes me still today is that when they answered, the Lord needs it, the owners willingly let that young colt go. And I don't want us to miss out on the importance and the value that this animal was to them. Luke uses the plural when he describes the owners, probably because these people were so poor that the animal represented a single family's investment. So King Jesus was asking them to give up something that was very valuable to them. Put in today's culture, this donkey could be represented by your house or a family heirloom. Can you imagine two strangers coming to your house and taking your brand new car from you with the words, the Lord needs it? But the question really comes down to this. Do we believe that everything belongs to the Lord and that he has a right to claim those things at any moment for any reason. You know, it's one thing to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior and as rightful owner of all things, but it's quite another matter to actually live that way. And as I, as I think about Jesus' request here, I can't help but wonder if I could give up something precious, something valuable in my life, simply because Jesus asked me to. How about you? As king of kings, he has the right. He has the right to demand something of you that you may hold very precious and very dear. Thirdly, as king, Jesus has the right to expect our praise. Starting with verse 35, we're told uh, how the crowd received Jesus. I'll read verses 35 through 38. They brought to the cult to Jesus threw their cloaks on it and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God in the highest. The significance of Jesus' arrival on this donkey wasn't lost to the crowd. They spontaneously threw their outer garments along the road. John 12 actually tells us that they waved palm branches, both being a traditional way of welcoming a conquering king. It's quite a reception. But not everyone was caught up in the enthusiasm of the moment, right? If you look at verse 39, it says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Have you ever noticed that the Pharisees were we're always close by just waiting to throw water on a fire, to put a damper on a celebration. We know a little bit about what motivated their hearts in doing this, but I love the response that Jesus gives in verse 40. He says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. 
If human voices remain silent, nature itself will be compelled to shout its praise to the Lord. So let's think about how we respond to certain times of excitement in our lives. How do you respond when a son or a daughter makes that, that game-winning shot at the end of a basketball game? Think how you respond when a grandchild gets their first hit on the baseball diamond. Think about how we respond when our favorite team wins the Super Bowl or the World Series. We go crazy, right? Shouts of praise, high fives all around. So I'd like you to think about this. Does the Lord deserve anything less? If heaven were based, if getting into heaven were based on how much praise we gave the Lord in this life, would we get in? Thankfully, it doesn't work that way. Still, as king, Jesus has a right to expect our praise. So on this Palm Sunday, let's be sure we take some time to share our praise to the Lord for his countless blessings. In fact, if, if you're one of those that's on Facebook, why don't you just take a note to down at the bottom of this post, those things that you are thankful for. Our last song this morning actually suggests that there are at least 10,000 reasons for us to do so. So join us in, in singing, Bless the Lord.
Until we meet again, this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be sure to note your words of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord below this post and, and keep an eye out this week for some short videos that will take us on a walk with Christ to the cross and to the resurrection. May God grant you a great Lord's Day.